Hello Internet and welcome back. In this video I will go through the process of setting up a custom board with TouchGFX and the STM32 Cube IDE. And why would I do that? Because you are probably familiar with these uh, development kits here. This is the STM32 F746 discovery board which has a nice 4.3 inch touchscreen, capacitive touchscreen and a lot of other peripherals. But you're not going to develop your target application on one of these, are you? Uh, this might be good, good f when you're developing the, the graphical interface and uh, to a certain extent also the, the actual hardware, but at some point you will want to create your own PCB. And this is where uh, stuff gets hard to figure out, because if you can't figure out stuff like this on your own, um, then you have to hire someone. There's a lot of people sitting very tightly on this kind of information, I think. Um, so what I'm going to go through today is I'm going to show you, uh, this is a hobby project of mine that I've been working on. I'm going to end up with a, a PDA sort of uh, device, like a handheld or a wrist mounted uh, communicator design with a 4.3 inch touchscreen. Uh, you're probably going to see uh, some glimpses of that uh, during the process. Um, I'm not going to share with you the code that I'm writing here. I'm not going to share the, the project code. Um, you can get that just as easily just by watching this video and you can write it uh, to a certain extent. Uh, you can just uh, copy the the steps I'm, I'm using here. I'm going to base uh, the project off of this discovery board here because this board is a great piece of kit and uh, you can get uh, very far with it. So this is going to be a very long video. Sorry about that. This is going to be a tour de force of hardware design, firmware development and a lot of other stuff. So um, I'm sorry beforehand because this is probably going to be a long video. But if you have questions or comments, yeah, man, let me know. Uh, down below. I'll try to answer them um, as good as I can. So how does one get about to doing a custom PCB? Well, what I did, um, yeah, so what I'm going to show you is we're, we're going to, I'm going to create a completely new project. I'm going to have my, my current project that I know is working. Uh, I have it working here on my bench. I'm going to have that uh, in the background. You're not going to see it. Uh, if I'm going to refer to that because there's something I can't remember. I'm going to pause the video, figure it out, and then just resume the recording. So you should get some kind of flow. Um, let's see here. The first thing I found was this actual schematics for this board here. And this board here has uh, this, uh, let me just show you here. Uh, that was the wrong camera. This is a 13 page of schematic that shows uh, or the describes the the discovery board here. So the first, if this is at all uh, unnerving or seems illogical, let me just real quick go through the what's going on here. So the first page here is a set of modules, different modules that is constructed in the design. We have the, the, the actual processor here and what you see here is buses. So these are pairs of wires. This is port A, 0 to 15, so this is, this is actually 16 wires going here. So we have all the ports, uh, GPIO pins here, we have LCD control signals and so on and so forth. So this is the complete uh, upper level design of the, the rest of the pages, so to speak. And I'm just going to go through these pages real quick, because there are some uh, stuff that you should be aware of when you're designing your own board. So on the first page here, this is, uh, it says here in the title down here, this is the ST-Link. And ST-Link is the pro programming interface that is attached or built into this board. So that enables us to just use a, a micro USB, no, sorry, a mini USB uh, connector and then um, program this board directly. Um, we don't need this in the final application. So if you're developing a board that should be mass produced, you could skip this part and just have the ST-Link on a separate board and uh, probably have a POCO pin interface uh, to, uh, to program your devices. And then you'll just have some test pads. I'll show you those uh, later on. The next page here, we have uh, uh, an expansion connector. Uh, this is, um, yeah, there is an I2C bus here. 
uh, and then an external reset connector here. Uh, I'm not going to use this, but so so a lot of this stuff we can remove for an, initi an initial prototype. There's a, a micro SD uh, card here, which is also available here on the on the back side of the um, of the PCB. There's a reset button and the, and a user button here, and this is just the basic schematic. You, you know we have to put this somewhere. Um, then we have here. This is the the audio codec, the audio in and out out. Uh, system uh, the the 746 has an i2s uh, interface so this what this is using there is a, a memory a quad spi flash or qspi this we're going to use so this is just going to be copied uh, one to one there is an arduino un uno connector these uh, are these uh, strips on the back side if we're not going to use those we can just skip those altogether there is an sd ram and why would you put SD RAM on a board like this? That's actually a very good question because you don't need this. If you are going to design uh, an interface, uh, so, so this is, uh, of course, this video is all about uh, running TouchGFX on an embedded system. And TouchGFX uh, only requires one frame buffer and you can store that internally. And if you don't have a lot of stuff going on, you can actually store uh, not not just one but two frame buffers um, the thing is that touch effects allows for a third frame buffer and uh, it was previously called animation storage so if you have an animation or uh, if you want to do fancy transitions where the, the where the pages or screens slide on top of each other you would want to have multiple frame buffers and for that you would want to have an external uh, memory uh, or RAM uh, connected to it. So if you're not going to use that or have fancy animation, you can actually skip this. But just keep in mind that footprints are free. If you design this and you decide not to use it, you can just uh, not populate the chip and skip the, the configuration of that uh, RAM interface. But later on, if you have made the hardware and you decide that you actually need this, it's way easier just to insert the chip. So yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna add one of these as well. On the next page here we have a USB on the go, uh, full speed with micro and AB connectors. It says here, um, so we can probably skip most of this this if we are not gonna use the USB interface. Then we have here, this is the actual uh, port, and what is important? I will just let me try to zoom in here a bit. It says here, uh, this is the yeah th this is the actual chip so you can see here we have three parts u5a u5b and u5c and u5 uh, sorry uh, u5a and b here is the pins and u5c which is the important one here this is all the power connectors so we have vdd which is the 3.3 volt we have a vss which is uh, the ground connection and then uh, we have the reference voltages and uh, a battery voltage and uh, there is VCAP1 and VCAP2 here and then this bypass regulator. Um, also we have some pins over here uh, in the f uh, U5A block. PDR on, boot1, NRST which is the main uh, reset pin and then we have the oscillator pins. So these pins here are really important and these pins down here are really important. The rest of them is basically just GPIOs. And what we use these GPIOs for, well, it's in the name, general purpose. We can configure this to m almost anything. So we have to keep these in mind when we are deciding. Uh, there is also a bunch of decoupling capacitors, one for each pin, usually. Let's see what the next page brings here. USB on the go high speed. So this is USB 2. Uh, I'm not going to use this in my designs. I'm just going to skip this page altogether. Uh, then we have the Ethernet. I'm not going to use Ethernet. Just skip this page. The external camera connector. I'm not going to use that either. And then we have the backlight uh, driver, uh, which is over here. And then we have the display connector. So this in some way I'm going to use. And that was actually all 13 pages of the schematic. A lot of those I'm not going to use at all. And this is really important. So we can start by, I would suggest if you're 
doing this uh, in real life, start by printing this out and get an overview of what connection is what. And then just remove all the pages that you don't need. If you don't need the camera connector, skip it. If you don't need the Ethernet, remove that and the USB and uh, the audio codec. If you don't need those, um, on this uh, discovery board here, you have a lot of chips. You can probably see them here. I could actually, I'm going to just, uh, let me just um, turn this on here. And that will print in here. And let me just point out a few things here. So uh, the focus should be working. So this is the main processor here, and this is a BGA, BGA package. So this is almost impossible to solve by hand. I'm just saying almost because I know a few guys uh, will not hesitate to do this by hand with a hot air or, or something similar, but it's 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 not fun to do. Uh, uh, this is professionally made, so of course we can use BGA, but this is a, let me just check. Um, I think this is an eight layer board. Uh, I think I saw a pin out or a layer. Yeah, we have eight layers. Um, it's it's hard to see and I can't, probably can't show it on video, but up here in the corner, there is a layer guide. And that layer guide shows you, um, it's very normal when you do PCBs, uh, you make a small square with a number, the layer number in it, and then uh, you clear out the cover so, so you can actually see the numbers going uh, between the layer down through the layers and I can see just I can see the one two three and four and on the back side I can see at least seven and eight but that's probably just because the lighting is bad so we have eight layers eight layers with six internal layers in this PCB that's a lot of layers that also means that we have blind and buried vs so we we, are, we would have a hard time de debugging this uh, actually the first design I made for testing this, uh, my schematic uh, I've, I did was a two-layer board, uh, and it worked. Uh, the board I'm showing you here, this is my uh, fourth generation, is a four-layer board, and I'm not going to use any more than four layers. The internal layers are power, and the the outer layers are the signals, so I can debug those somewhat easily. Okay, just carrying on here. We had the main chip here. We have SD RAM over here. We have the Ethernet uh, foo down here, and this chip here is the audio codec. And this chip is is not fun at all. Uh, I think it's not even a BGA. It's some well, oh yeah, it is BGA, but it's it's really a small chip. Then over uh, uh, between the the Arduino headers here, we have the the QSPI, the Quad SPI flash. We have some uh, regulators over here. The ST link is down here, and uh, we have the USB uh, uh, stuff going on here. Then we have a host of connectors up here: the external header, the SPDIF camera interface, micro SD. We have the user button, the reset button, and some power um, uh, power selectors. So there's a lot of stuff in this board that we don't uh, that uh, uh, that I don't need. Uh, I should note that the display here is, is on the other side, it's just glued with uh, some uh, foam adhesive and there's nothing underneath. There is no connector, so you can't dis detach the, the display. It's just solar directed to the board, so don't bother. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you just briefly what uh, what a design could be like. And this is the, this design I made is not perfect in any way. Uh, but it's mine. Uh, oh, this was the board. We need to open the schematic. So this is the board, and this is the schematic here. Let me just show you here. And okay, so I'm using a uh, KiCad, and I have made three uh, schematics. This is the main processor. Uh, and of course, I have a, a a bit more going on because I I removed all the stuff I didn't need, and then I added the stuff I did need. So this board here is uh, mainly over here. All these parts here. This is the GPIO pins. I created a symbol down here. So this is the the power block or the power part of the symbol. Just that, like we had in the in here, we have all the VD and VSS. Uh, pins I've created the same but I just added these pins and 
Now for the first bit of hardware debugging. So vref plus is the reference to the AD converter. And you can see here, I just connected this to uh, two decoupling capacitors. I forgot in my fourth generation of design, I forgot to add VDD to this. Um, so that meant when I finally got around to use the AD converter for measuring the battery uh, voltage, this didn't work at all. So I have a nice uh, wire on my board. But these pins are the ones, and also the VCAP, these are the ones that you should check first. Um, in a while, I'm gonna we're gonna go through the the bring up of the hardware and see if and uh, what what is necessary. But um, yeah, uh, I added an accelerometer here and I added an, an ESP32 Wi-Fi module here. There's a uh, uh, this Max chip here is uh, an audio amplifier I2S audio amplifier that is connected to the to the Wi-Fi module. I have some. Uh, WS2812 LEDs up here, uh, a lot of stuff going on. And I have a sheet called connectors, it is not just connectors, I have a USB connector uh, with um, with a charger attached and uh, that can charge my battery. Uh, I also have a voltage regulator uh, and I have my backlight driver, it's not connectors at all this, <laughs> this sheet. Uh, and then I have my LED interface here, uh, also I have my touchscreen interface. And uh, then the last sheet here, that is my memory. Uh, remember I said that footprints are free. So we have the SD RAM uh, interface, some de decoupling capacitors here, and we have the, the QSPI. That's about it. Uh, actually, if we go back to the processor, I could remove uh, almost all these parts here, I think. Um, the only part I do need is the, the decoupling capacitors down here. and a lot of pull up pull down resistors here and I have uh, attached an external oscillator so that's a 25 megahertz oscillator that's just running all the time uh, that's about it um, of course this takes some time to to put together and this is the design I ended up with I can just show you a 3d version um, so this is a 3d rendering of the board you can see this is a display connector here. This is my touch, uh, my digitizer connector. Over here I have the the backlight driver. I have chosen uh, to use an LQFP package because this I can actually solder by hand. Uh, so the first prototype is completely hand soldered. Of course, this is not feasible if you are entering a production uh, period. Down here I have the QSPI. I have my voltage regulators up here, uh, the battery charge USB connection. Um, there's a hole in the board here that's actually for a small vibration motor so when I receive a message I can give the user an indication and on the back side I have the SD RAM again I have chosen to use a hand solar friendly package and I have my ESP32 module over here and I mentioned before that you're probably going to use uh, test pins so the idea for this board here is I have these uh, pads here these uh, will interface with uh, spring-loaded pins. So I'm going to 3D print a bracket where I can push this uh, board. When I have assembled it, push it down and make these uh, six connections. Uh, we have the um, we have the, the interface, the single-wire clock, single-wire uh, debug input-output um, for the SM32. We have the TX and RX pins, which is a serial connection to the SP32 module the boot pin and the reset pin for the ESP32 module. And what is not shown here is uh, I'm gonna, I need uh, a power source as well. And this up here, J1, is an, uh, an expansion header for, yeah, expansions. There is an I2C and a, and a serial port and a power interface in this. So I'm gonna use these uh, pads up here for the power connection. So this is a ground connection and this over here is a 3.3 volt connection. I'm gonna spring load uh, a connector to that as well. So I can um, streamline the programming process because when I have the, the final uh, firmware image, I can just put it into this cradle and press program. I can program at both chips at once and can automate that process. At least that's the, that's, that's the goal of this. Okay, so 
this is this was it for the hardware design. I'm not gonna go into details about this. If you have questions or comments about the hardware design, by all means, write a comment, l leave a note, send me an email, uh, whatever you want to. Um, but this video is already getting too long, and I'm, we're supposed to focus on the setting up the the firmware. So um, what we can do is uh, we can. Really quick, just try STM32. We have this um, cube programmer. Um, I'm probably gonna find that in my. You need to install that if you want to try out uh, or, or run uh, TouchFX Designer projects on your on your board. Uh, let me just see if I can find this cube programmer on my computer, because the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we have a connection to the board. And Cube Programmer is a uh, is a uh, fine way of doing this. So I'm just gonna show you here. Um, I have a, an ST Link, uh, just a USB ST Link, a cheap Chinese one, connected to, to the pins. Of course, I know that my board is working, but this is the first thing that we should do. We, um, we have the ST Link uh, or STM32 Cube Programmer running here. I'm just gonna press Connect here. And it actually says no STM32 target found because we have a problem. I need to turn on the power. So this board is powered externally. Let me just turn it on. Okay, so now I've turned on my power supply. I can press connect. And you can see now we can access the memory. It, it, we can read the memory. And uh, what is important here is that we just have the ST-Link working. That means that all the voltage supplies in the in the chip is working and our debug interface is working that is the first thing that we need to make sure if that doesn't work what then I'm we're just going to go back to um to to the schematic just just briefly i said this was going to be a long video so we have to look at these pins here um vcap 1 and vcap 2 is capacitors for stabilizing the internal voltage regulators and you should be able to measure about 1.2 volt uh, on these two pins if you cannot do that then you have a problem with the voltage regulators also uh, boot zero here should be uh, pulled down for my specific boot purpose at least uh, we also have this bypass regulator here pull that down the NRST, the main reset line here, should be pulled up. PDR on should be also pulled up. These pins measure these the values or the voltages of these pins to make sure that these are the right. And yeah, I did that, you're probably saying. Well, check again. Check every single of these pins. Because if you have a problem with these pins, the STM32 will not boot properly. And um, if you start looking in the ST community forums, you'll see that there's a lot of people having problems with uh, getting the initial uh, boot up sequence right. The boot zero here is uh, is how the chip should boot, um, and there are different uh, ways that it could boot. Uh, you have to refer to the manual for that. For my purpose, at least, this is a con configuration that works. So. I guess that, <laughs> that could also work for you. I don't know. Um, but when we have a link in the STM32 cube programmer, then you know that you have a debug interface that is working. That is step one. All right. Let's just close this. Now we can open up the cube IDE and make sure that you have the latest version. This, uh, I know it said uh, 130. Uh, actually, this is 150 right now. So, yeah. And we'll get back to why that is an issue later on. Okay, so let me just close all the files open very quick. Okay, so this is my uh, system right now, set up right now. I have three programs here. The topmost one is the uh, my reference project, so to speak. But let's see if I can manage and and get this working without referring to that. Okay, so we are 25 minutes into this video already. We start by creating a new STM32 project. Uh, let's just do that. 
So this is a completely custom project that was set up from scratch. And yes, this is gonna take some time, but it should be worth it, you know? So first of all, of course, we should select uh, the target processor. And I know already that this is a 746, so we're not gonna spend too much time. Also, I know this is an LQFP uh, 176 with one megabyte of uh, flash. So this one is my processor. Press next. Project name, video demo. You call it whatever you want. We target the language as C++ because I want to integrate uh, with the TouchGFX, which is C++ based. And press next and press finish. Now it's combining all the stuff that it needs. And this is the first time I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say it uh, multiple times. Cube IDE or Cube MX is a hardware configurator. Cube MX only configures the hardware. So that configures which pins are assigned to which function and stuff like that. It does not give you any software initialization. So if you're coming from a pro project where you tried using the TouchGFX designer and used an application template to uh, upload directly to a target like this, TouchGFX designer would actually include the software configuration like setting up timings for the display and setting up timings for the SDRAM. You do not get this when you're doing a custom project. You do not get a touch controller driver. You have to include this and everything by yourself. That was the first time I said it. So um, right now we have a blank chip. And um, the first thing I'm gonna add here is I'm going to add uh, go to RCC, let's see here. We have a high-speed clock, a uh, crystal ceramic resonator. Uh, I think that is the one. Um, let's just go to, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, the system. Sorry, I was confused here. Uh, we have a debug system, which is serial wire. And you can see now uh, we get the pins assigned here. Actually what I can do, I can right click here and say signal pinning because now these pins won't be able to move. And that is important because a few of the peripherals that I'm gonna turn on have alternate pins at, and I'm not using the default pinout. And that is also important because later we're gonna use what's called an external loader to you to, to load the contents into the flash memory, the quad SPI flash memory. And that is not using the standard pins. So, and writing that loader is a whole completely different beast. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna refer to my project or my working project. I'm gonna open that up in the STM Cube MX on another screen. Let's see here, load project. Uh, and then actually I'm just gonna copy that screen. Uh, or copy those pins um, to make sure that, that this is working. Let me just see here. Uh, there we have it. There, there. So we need um, to include a minimum set, a minimal set of peripherals to get this working. Uh, I can just, this is my I know that this is working here. So you can see there's a lot of pins that is attached to, to functionality. And we're just gonna uh, include these uh, one by one. Uh, and then we're gonna check that these are working uh, or uh, that they are in the, in the right order here. So um, we can do this in a number of ways. We can just uh, go to, for example, connectivity here and say, I'm gonna use this uh, flexible memory controller. I have an SDRAM. And um, this is, to a large extent, right now I'm referring to the other project on the other screen, of course, but this is uh, copied initially from the IOC file of this, uh, this the discovery board here. So 
I would like to try and not do any or too many assumptions, um, but but these values here are basically just taken from the discovery setup. Um, what is not taken from from that setup here is, for example, here uh, we have down here um, the the latency of the memory, and you have um, the common clock, and um, we have here the the delays and stuff like that. These values here, uh, to a certain extent, you can get these. Either you can start off by using the delays that are available in in the discovery setup, or uh, you should. Well, of course, you you can find these and calculate these based on the information that you have from the the RAM datasheet. Uh, I said just a second before that. I didn't want to do any assumptions. Um, and I get why you might find this strange that I'm just entering these numbers. I have them on, on in the other project. Um, but where did I get these numbers from? Um, well, it's in the data sheet. That's the, that's the easiest thing to say. I have another video where I go into detail about how to set up this uh, RAM. And I think I go through how to get these values as well. Again, Keep in mind, this is the hardware setup. So the SDRAM requires a certain firmware configuration. That we need to send some configuration commands to the uh, to the RAM before it is working. We are not going to do that just yet, uh, but we have to keep in mind that we have to do it at some point. That was the FMC, and you can see that um, we have a lot of pins here. I'm just going to verify these really quick. Uh, these are good, so I'm gonna just going to pin these. There is no reason to not pin those, because I don't want these to be able to move. Because if I enable another function at some point, um, they're going to move about. Uh, let's see here. Specifically, it's the, it's the quad SPI that moves about, so maybe I should just start that and pin it down. Okay, let I have a bank one with single and dual lines here and this is one of the important ones these are overlooked these values here so the clock prescaler is one the fever threshold is four uh, sample shifting during half cycle and flash size this is actually a very funny number so flash size is not the amount of bytes or bits you have in your flash memory it's how many data bits do you need to address your full uh, flash address space so if you need 24 bits, like I do, then you have 24 bits to address your memory. And that should be enough for 128 megabits, I guess. Uh, so we can address every single uh, byte in, in the memory. Uh, also, I need six cycles for the chip select high time, low, uh, that's it. But these are really important here. Um, okay. That was for the quad SPI, and then we need... Um, Actually, we don't need that much more here right now. We can go to the multimedia, and then we want to enable um, the DMA here. And what is important about the DMA, we also want to use this global interrupt. And let's see here, we have uh, parameters, settings, memory to memory, RGB. I'm just going to use an RGB, uh, so we have uh, 24 bits of uh, colors. And um, that's about it here. And then we're going to the LTDC. That is uh, uh, the LTD interface. We're going to use all 24 bits here. And this uh, we requires a little bit of uh, setup. For the fir first thing, we're going to uh, we're going to enable the LTDC global interrupt because this interrupt is what drives. Um, I think is driving the touch GFX. So you want to have that. Um, let's go to uh, parameter settings. No, layer settings first. So layer settings. Consider that uh, that the STM32 can actually handle two pictures at once. And it can mix these two pictures. So you could, uh, you could write or uh, update one uh, while displaying the other one. Um, and then you can swap them. Uh, that that's supported in hardware. I think that's that's what we're what's being discussed here. But 
uh, we are going to use only one layer because that one layer is updated by the touch GFX. Now I'm uh, I'm setting the the size of my screen. I have uh, 480 pixels uh, horizontally, and I have 272 lines. Uh, the format is RGB 888. If you are coming f or uh, using, specifying, or looking up information in um, in the application template using the 746 board, uh, this is using an RGB 565 interface. Uh, that means um, that there is a, a problem, so to speak. Uh, here, let me just uh, go here. Uh, when we have the frame buffer here, we are setting the start address, and the start address is going to be 0x uh c zero 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 this is the starting address of the sd ram uh and we're just gonna uh code that here and uh, we have the buffer line length that's um 480 the same size as the display and 272 uh buffer uh, what, what it says here lines so it says image width and image height um, and that's about it. Then we can go to parameter settings here, and again, a lot of questions about these here. This is display specific. Um, let me just say again, CubeMX is uh, is only setting up hardware, so this is a hardware timing stuff. Also, TouchGFX is, uh, I really like this explanation, uh, Martin from TouchGFX have written a few times, TouchGFX is display agnostic. That means that TouchGFX doesn't care at all about what display you're, you're putting onto the ST processor. You can put uh, on whatever display you want. TouchGFX only maintains a frame buffer. So it updates this frame buffer, uh, this piece of or area with, with pixel information, and what you want to do with that information is entirely up to you. So if you want to shift this out over an SPI line, by all means, write an SPI driver that shifts out the, the pixel data and, and does that. Um, or you can use the, the built-in LTDC interface and use either a parallel or a DSI, a serial interface to a display. Um, but TouchGFX does not care. TouchGFX is running only in firmware. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up, this is specific for my display. Uh, you can see active width here is 640 pixels. This number number is oddly familiar, so I'm going to set this to um, 40 or 480. And again, these numbers here, uh, I found these partly in my datasheet for my display and partly by uh, by debugging. I can simply take a magnifying glass on my display and see there is a line that is not showing, there is uh, pixels not utilized. Um, so imagine you have, a, let me just show you a picture of that. Uh, display. Actually, it makes more sense when you see a picture of it. Uh, so I'm just going to show you this picture here. I just Googled this, uh, let's just view image. Okay, so I hope you can see this. Uh, it's not a good picture but you have this is the complete um, data area of your display you have a visible area which is the active pixels but there's a vertical front porch and you have a back porch and also you have a back porch here and a horizontal front porch here these are areas where the display needs some dummy data um, think of it like if you had an old CRT uh, cathode ray tube, uh, you are scanning each line. And you need some time for the electron beam to reset itself and to go back to start before it can, it can do something. And when you are going back across the screen, you don't want to write anything more. You want to have some dummy data that is empty or n not set in order not to disturb the display. And it's the same thing here. The vertical front porch is set up data that uh, comes to the display controller before uh, we're actually starting to provide data. And then for each line, you provide these a uh, few pixel uh, data with uh, the front porch. Then you have the whole line of, of data and then the back porch. And then so on and so forth. 
all the way down. Um, so these are the numbers that we're setting up. Uh, I just uh, punched in the numbers for my display on the line basis. Now I'm going to do it on the... Uh, uh, sorry, the pixels first. For one single line, I'm going to do the the vertical stuff here. Um, again, I know this seems like a lot of assumptions. Try and look in the data sheet first. These numbers sh should be there in some sort of an uh, some sort of other. Also, I have, a, I have another polarity on my synchronization pulse. So I'm just going to set that here like this. Um, and that should be it for my LCDC interface. So far, I'm doing great, I think. Let me just go back here and say see if my pins are aligned properly. I can see uh, I have a QSPI here, up here. So the nice thing is that I can I can press this here and I can see all the different uh, options I have for pins here. I know that this should be the Quad SPI BK1 IO2 here. So I'm just going to punch them in here and it's going to be... Um, be uh, yellow because it's not configured yet. Did I skip the Quad SPI? No, it's there. Uh, let me just check if other Quad SPI pins are the way it should be. IO3 is PF6, so I need to use this one here. And the IO0 is there. I'm just gonna lock that. And I'm gonna lock the one. LCDE is also locked. I have the Oh, oh! I also have a conflict here. The memory controller. Uh, I have my LCD R5 there. Just you can see now, pins are um, jumping up and down here. Uh, PC2 is fine. This is fine. So we should we should find some other stuff that is uh, that is not right here. R2, R1, R0. I know this is probably not a very interesting part of the video and you are welcome to skip this. If you need this, then by all means, just go through this. Um, to a certain degree, you could um, you could copy this from the Discovery Kit, but just bear in mind that Discovery Kit is not using the, um, this, the, the standard pinout either. Um, so you might want to, yeah, you might run into some uh, some trouble here. PC4 is the, uh, and it's it's the it is deliberate that I'm not just uh, pausing the video here and and edit editing this out because, again, someone might need this. Oh, for example, here up here, this is we're gonna be blue six. Um, so I, ha I still have a problem with my quad SPI. Um, I'm not sure why yet, uh, but it should. Uh, you can see here we have a conflict. Uh, the FMC and the LTDC is in conflict right now. So we just need to go through all the pins that, I, that we have enabled here. Uh, let's see here. We have... Ah, then we have P1 here. That should be the NBL1 there. And here we should have NBL0. And then we have B7. That is fine. Just pin this down. Um, also, I have uh, on PB4 here, I have uh, uh, the PWM signal for my backlight driver. So I'm just going to put this as a GPIO output. If we just put this to high, then we'll just run at uh, full backlight power, though, which is fine. Uh, these are good. We just pin these down. And then we have the B2 there. Uh, what is really strange is that the, the LTDC interface is scattered this uh, like this all around, um, all around the, the pins here. But well, that's the hardware. Uh, PD4 here is connected to my enable pin on my display so this is gonna be um, a GPIO output and you're just gonna toggle that I'm just actually I'm gonna rename this enter user label and can just call this LCD underscore disp it's the same name as the discovery board 
Let's see here. We have the FMC D3, D2 here. We're just going to pin those like this. Uh, we have G7 over here. Pin that. Uh, when we have, oh, there's another G6 there. Uh, G3 is right. Uh, let me see here. Then on PC9 here, I have an, a pin, which is an output. I just put an LED there. I'm just going to call it LED underscore test. It's a really good idea to just put an LED on one pin somewhere, because that's the first thing we can test. If we can access this pin, we know that our program is running. That's pretty neat. Uh, let me just continue here. PG8. Oh. There's another issue here. We have the clock for our SD RAM. Uh, then we have the LTDC clock, R7, BA1, BA6. I just pin these. So when you should when you're starting this process here, actually what I do is I start off in Cube MX and figure out if I can access the functionality I, I can I can I enable all the access all the functionality that I want so do I want to have my LTDC or my LTD interface I want to have my SD RAM interface um, can I enable all these modules you can see now right now we have some errors over here we cannot enable the Ethernet and the FMC has some, some error but we should resolve these um, so before I start my hardware design, I actually start in CubeMX and see is this chip the uh, right at all. And uh, because I was I, when I started this, I started with the the 144 pin version of my um, of the F76, and that interface uh, that has that doesn't the chip hasn't got enough pins to enable the the LTDC interface and the SDRAM interface. So there was a pin conflict that couldn't be resolved. At least that's how I remember it. Um, so, so in order to to make this work, we had to rem or I had to change this to to the larger chip. Uh, let me see here. I might have D forty five D six. Just pin these down. So I'm still resolving a fair amount of issues here. 7, 8, 9, 7, 12, G4, 5. So, um, so whenever I see pins that are right, I'm just pinning them because then they won't be able to move. And then we'll, uh, these will also stay locked. So even though you want, you are adding functionality, these will uh, say, hey, you can just add this uh, even though you want to. Um, Let's see here, PB0 is R3, that is right. And we have R6 right next to it there. And we have the clock there. Oh, and then we have the this one. And we have the FMC A6. Okay. Uh, so I probably overlooked something because these are still... Let me just go to the FMC here. SDRAM is not fully configured. No, I know. Oh, we need to and do this again. This was 12 bits, and everything is green now. The quad SPI is uh, okay. Let's see here. What is wrong with this one? Uh, okay, no mode. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I want to do this. Use a constant keypad or settings. Okay, so we have four pins. I'm doing something wrong here. Let me just go back and check the quad SPI interface. And I want, sorry, oh yeah, this is not single dual lines, this is quad SPI. Of course it's quad SPI, that's what I told you. Okay, so I have PB2, I have PB6, I have PE2, I have PF6, uh, and PF8 and PF9, yeah. So this is just how it's supposed to be. Okay, so now we have, 
we have here, we have the FMC, we have the Quad SPI. You can see we're getting all kinds of error, or not errors, it, these are warnings and saying we have a partial conflict, so we cannot enable all uh, the full SPI 6 module, for example. Okay. Uh, we have the DMA, we have the LTDC, which is all we need. We can go to security. You have to rem uh, to activate this random number generator. And that is because the TouchGFX is locked to STM32. And I think this random number generator is used uh, as part of that locking me mechanism. Oh, sorry, that is uh, CRC. My mistake, CRC. We need to enable CRC. Uh, let me just check, enable, enable, non-disabled bytes. Yes, that's fine. We don't need this RNG. We can just disable this random number generator. Stupid me. Okay, uh, middleware. Yes, we're gonna uh, do that in just a single uh, second. First of all, we need to add TouchGFX. And we do that uh, by going to software packs up here, select components and we can see here, uh, we can go to ST Microelectronics, uh, and then we can expand this here. Um, the latest version right now is 4.15.0. I'm going to select this TouchGFX generator, and you can see we have green check marks here. If you haven't installed this, you should have the option to install it here. And when we press OK here, um, you need to install the designer as well, and if you haven't done that already, uh, let me just show you. You can go to uh, to your username here, go to the STM32 cube, repository, packs, STM, and then the touch X cube, touch FX 4.15.0, and in the uh, pro utility, sorry, PC software, touch FX designer, there's the installer for the TouchGFX designer. Install that and then come back here. Okay, so we have um, activated, you can see now in software packs, we have the the, um, the graphic application. We want this, so we just put a check mark here. And these values down here, these are important. So let me just refer to this. This is the standard and this is not working. So, so, well, this is the default values, and of course we need to tweak those. I, the interface is, in my case, going to be this LTDC interface. So if you're developing your own driver, you can, of course, select something else here, but if you're using the LTDC interface, that makes sense. Frame buffer pixel format is going to be the same as the LTDC, RGB888. And the width and height is coming from the LTDC interface. So if you are configuring TouchGFX, as the first thing, you might want to uh, stop there and go and configure the LTDC interface first. Uh, okay. Frame buffer uh, strategy. Remember where I said that if you're just doing static pictures that uh, that don't need fancy interactions and, and sliding animation stuff like that, you can you can yeah you're good with the single buffer. I want to do a double buffer. You can also do a partial buffer if you want to save on memory. Um, I haven't any experience with that, so I'm going to use double buffer. And that double buffer is not going to be by allocation. I'm going to use by address here. And I'm going to use the same address uh, as, um, as the layer information. And this is also important. If you're coming from... Actually, I had a strange issue with this when I was uh, developing the, the first uh, version of this. So this is the first frame buffer start address. And this is the starting address of the STRAM. And you have to, uh, we have to write the second frame buffer. And also, if you want to use that animation story, the third frame buffer, we actually have to have to indicate that as well. Um, so this value here, we of course, it makes sense to have one frame buffer here and then the next right next to it. But um, the values that I wrote in the beginning were based on the application template from the TouchFX designer. And I'm using uh, the 24 bits, and the TouchFX designer is using a 16-bit interface. So the second start address was uh, smaller than I wanted it to be. So that meant that the second frame buffer was actually writing into the area of the first one because my first frame buffer was larger. And that gave me some really strange artifacts. 
and I was about to write a forum post asking about this when it occurred to me I need to calculate this. So what we can do is we can take the base address. Actually, you can just take your calculator in uh, in Windows here and ch change that to programmer. Um, so what we can do is we can calculate. Well, I'm using 24 bytes or bits. I have uh, 480 pixels on 400 or 272 lines. So I need 3,133,440 bits. Uh, I can write that in in um, in hexadecimals, so that is two f d zero zero zero. So that will be my. Uh, I'm I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. I need to divide this by eight, I think, so because this is bits. Divide by eight. Yes, sorry, this is in bytes, and of course this value down here is also in bytes. Um, so 5FA00, these are the amount of bytes that I need in order to store one complete frame buffer. And simply we can just add that down here so we can write the C and then we can write um, 5FA00, then the second frame buffer will be um, the right place. Of course, if you, uh, th th so the first, um, the first calculation was 24 bits times the size of the display. And if you only use 16 bits, 16 times uh, 480 times 272 uh, divided by 8, this will be the value that you would need, uh, which is slightly less. Um, I did something wrong here. <laughs> uh, didn't I? Well, anyway. Um, 16 by 480 by 272 divided by 8. Mm. 24 by divided by 8. What am I doing now? Oh, yeah. I'm screwing up the numbers here. This is uh, I should stay in decimal <laughs> when you're doing this. 24 bytes by 480 bytes 272 divided by 8. Convert that to hex 5FA00. That is right. And if you're doing 16 bits by 480 by 272 divided by 8, convert that to hex 3FC00. And if you look into the application template that uh, is in the touch effects designer this is the value that it will find you can see that is less so if you are less than than the, the the amount of space that i need so if you are using all 24 bits in your display then you will see some strange stuff going on okay let's just carry on this uh application tick source this is really important because we want the ltdc uh to drive the touch gfx um clock so to speak also, I want to have the DMA 2D, the Chrome Art uh, Accelerator, and I want to have uh, a real-time operating system. Okay, so this is the setup that we need here. I will go to middleware, I will go to uh, Free Atos, select the CMSIS version 2, and this is uh, also quite important here. We want in tasks and queues here, you can see you have a default task here, uh, and if you just double click this, you will we'll have all these information here. Default tasks. Then um, the touch GFX will create as a task for itself that will uh, take up eight kilowatts of uh, memory. So we have to make sure that there is space enough for for that. Uh, we'll create another task to handle all our. That could be serial ports, that could be hardware interrupts, uh, whatever you want. So I'll just call, uh, make one called uh, hardware task. The priority will be uh, normal. That's the same priority that touch effects have. If you have uh, something that is critical, you might want to bump this up in order to get priority over touch effects. I want to give this uh, 512 
uh, words of stack size here. My entry function is uh, start uh, hardware. This is just names. Start hardware task, and that's that's it here. Okay. Uh, let me just check if we need. We can go to the free autos heap usage. You can see we still have thirteen uh, thousand one hundred ninety-two bytes available for heap. If you create a lot of tasks, this number might uh, run. You might run out. So you can go into config parameters here, and down here total heap size. You just increase this. Uh, you shouldn't need to increase it uh, to an extremely large number, but you just increase this. Uh, I think that's the only change I did in here. So let me just press Control S. Oh yeah, and we just generate the code. This might take. Um, when RTOS is used, it's strongly recommended to use a HAL time-based source other than SysTick. The HAL time-based source can be changed from the pinout tab under Sys. Uh, yes, of course. So we just go to our Sys tab. Sys tab. Okay, and the here the time base I'm gonna use is timer six, and that is just because that's the same uh, time source that the discovery board is using. Actually, I forgot one more thing. We're going to need to go to clock configuration here. So what we see here is the is the clock tree. This is the configuration that uh, how is the clock distributed inside the chip and. One very very important thing is that um, of course we we want to use that we have a 25 megahertz oscillator externally. So I'm gonna change this here, and also now you can see that our the clock to the LTDC the LCD TFT is 75 megahertz. My display won't recognize this as a valid clock signal, so I need to. Um, take this down a notch actually we need to get down to 10 mega megahertz so you can adjust these pll values here as you as you please i know that i have something that works here uh, so i'm just gonna um, change this uh, let me just see also this one here uh, i'm gonna bump this up because i want to have a high speed in my uh, peripheral clocks here i'm gonna change this to 300 also again uh, you can press resolve clock issues up here if you want to, but um, I'm again I'm I'm using as much as possible from the discovery board. Uh, there's no need for me to change this uh, because I'm not completely sure what is actually going on here. Um, have a have a rough idea. Um, what is interesting is uh, to how to get the 400 megahertz. Now I'm running at 100. I will want to divide that by 5 and divide this by 8 and then we have 10 megahertz. And of course, uh, if you want to enable the USB here, uh, then you might want to change. Uh, this should be... Basically, there shouldn't be any red stuff in here. Uh, then you have a clock, um, a clock problem. I'm using full speed, which is the slowest USB clock. That uh, should be a multiple of... 12 megahertz, if I remember correctly. Uh, in my other design, I'm using 48, which is fine, but I think it should be a multiple of 12. I might be wrong here. So basically, no red stuff here. I'm going to press Control S again. Do we want to generate code? Uh, I want to leave this unchecked because I want to have some sort of control of when to generate code. Uh, it's not that I go in this uh, section often, but it's nice to be able to yeah uh, to control so now we have a long main file here we have almost 600 lines of code and this uh, code here uh, let me just see here yeah okay uh, this is our uh, the main file that will uh, initialize everything I want to go into the touch JVEC folder here you can see we have uh, this application template dot touch gfx dot part. I'm just gonna double click this. This is a partial touch gfx project. It will open. Um, it's a minimal project, so it will open in my touch gfx designer. And it's an empty project. I'm just gonna create 
a simple project with a box and a button and if you have watched some of my other videos you will know exactly what is going going to happen here i'm just gonna uh, do a button here in the middle i'm gonna create another screen create a box and a button uh, this is one of the minimal examples to show you uh, that we have this working i'm just going to change this to green uh, it green here and put the button here i'm going to add an interaction so when we cr click this button here we're going to change back to the screen i'm going to use a sliding transition because then you can see that the animation uh, is actually working let's just real quick go to the screen uh, the first screen here add another interaction when the button is clicked um, if this is going way too fast then it doesn't really matter what we're doing here um, I just have two screens now where a button can change between one of them or the other. What is important is that we can generate code up here. So generate code and we can see here, we can click here, click on the whole bar actually down here. And we should see that everything is generated and it says done. We can close this up again and we can right click here and then we can refresh or hit F5. You can see now we get a lot of more uh, stuff here uh, let's just try to build this and see what happens I'm expecting some errors because I'm missing something but let's see what happens it's building 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 okay it's actually running fine uh, let's just let me just go in back here into the IOC because uh, I was actually um, we should have uh, in our free authors we should have a task called um, for the the cube ID or the the touch effects. Let's just disable this, generate this code, and then just. Uh, re-enable it let's see what happens and again I don't want to edit this out because you might be in the same situation that's something is wrong so just add this and it should remember everything let's go to the free autos task that is really strange uh, did I forget something hmm. You can see we have the, the, the hardware task here, uh, but we don't have the uh, initialization of the... So if I go into my other project that I know that is working... Uh, you can see here that... Uh, We have this touch effects in it um, code here, and we yeah well, I actually have that there, and we should have somewhere we want to start this um, calling the touch effects process, but we are not anywhere. That is really strange. Um, okay, I remember it as. Uh, that the free artists should create this for us, but I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Um, it, uh, I might be wrong. Okay, let's just add another task, and let's call this uh, touch touch GFX task. Priority should be uh, normal. Stack size here, I set this to 8192. Start, uh, start, start, uh, GGFX task. Okay. Uh, okay, we don't have enough uh, heap for that. So I want to go to my config here and change this to, let's just say, 30,000 30, here. Task and queues, just change this again to uh, like this. And what? Out of range?
Maybe. Oh, it's still not big enough. Okay. Like this. Let's see. Yes. 8192. Okay. So now we have the two tasks here. Uh, we can press Control S. Okay. Save this. Yes. Generate code. And the only thing that we should need to do now. Oh, yeah. We need to make sure that the there is a in the um, we have some pins uh in our gpio here we have the lcd or LE, lcd te led test here the output level this is the level it should be set to we can set that to high that means it turns on also we have the LE lcd disp um i want to set that to uh, high as well because that means that we turn on our LED or LCD, if I remember correctly. We also should have uh, this PB4. This is our uh, backlight. So we set this to high as well. And we just save this and run again. Let's see what happens. So remember, this is hardware configuration. We haven't initialized our modules. That was the third time I said that. So Cube MX have initialized all the pins and all that stuff, but we haven't told the SDRAM or the QSPI how to behave. So if we need to uh, initialize that in some way, we need to do something. Um, so what we can do now is that, of course, we can build this. Um, I want to just, um, we just close this IOC file. I think we're done with that. Uh, we scroll down here to the start touch effects task. The only thing that we need down here is we, we need to call MX underscore, let's see, uh, touch effects process. And uh, just about here, in my previous video, my audio decided to stop recording. So, uh, this is a second recording. The first hour and 12 minutes are just fine, I think. Um, if not, leave a, leave a comment. Um, we ended up here by adding this MX touch underscore touch GFX underscore process in uh, the start GFX task. And um, we should try to compile this and build this. Let's see. And uh, of course, now it builds perfectly. This project was working. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna I'm gonna differ a bit from the the video content, and the you're never gonna know because you haven't you probably haven't seen the first video. So we can take a look in the in the video uh, or video demo. This is the project name over here. If we uh, un uh, unfold this, you can see there's a lot of different uh, folders over here. It's worth noting that in the core uh, folder, we have a source and include folder. And in the source, this is where our main file is located. Of course, we also have uh, main.h, uh, which is the header file that is uh, yeah, accompanying the main.c file. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a good idea to just familiarize yourself with the, with the structure of the project. Also, for example, in the touch GFX folder here, we have the GUI uh, folder, which has a source uh, folder and include folder. And these folders here are where the TouchGFX uh, files are stored. So for every screen you have, you will have a folder containing or uh, with the name of the screen name underscore screen. So if you want to add something to a screen programmatically, you can find the view and the presenter files here. That's very nice to know. So. We can right click this and we can say clean projects uh, and then we're probably about the same uh, where, we're, where the previous video ended. So I can build this video and let's see what happens. So we are building, we are compiling all the files. Everything should compile at this point. And uh, I think I left you off where uh, so we have a project that builds, which is great. And let's try to debug this. And the way we're debugging this, the first time you try to this if you just press this button here you will see um, this image here and um, we'll just go through this really quick here 
there are a few uh, tabs here in the debugger tab here I'm using the ST link um, there's not no changes here whatsoever um, there have a few sh changes that I'm gonna uh, enter later so if you want to use an external loader you can choose down here uh, I'm not gonna do that now because we're not using the uh, QSPI flash at this point I'll m follow this video up with another video where we uh, where we add this flash flash and add the memory space to the linger files as well. So um, we pr just press debug here and then let's just uh, press uh, this button here. We should see the display um, or the board. We are verifying code has been downloaded and verified su uh, successfully and we are just waiting. So we can press start here. And you can see that the display is actually doing something. So, um, so something is happening, but there's no content on the display. And this is where it gets um, hairy. So let me say again, CubeMX is a hardware configurator. It does not configure your uh, peripherals um, and set them up for, for use. It just configures the hardware connections, okay? So let's just stop this debugging session here. So what we what we're needing here, um, TouchGFX is maintaining this frame buffer, and it's supposed to put this frame buffer uh, or frame buffers into the SDRAM, but the SDRAM is not capable of taking any information, and you you can we cannot uh, send and receive data from the SDRAM just yet. So if we look into the application template we will see that we actually have some additional code available in uh, in the SDRAM configuration so you can find this if you are using the 746 board you can find for that specific uh, RAM chip you can find all this in the yeah, in the application template so if you're using the 429 board you can find that specific RAM uh, configuration um, so this configuration will be specific for that uh, RAM chip that you choose and you will find uh, that you can calculate some of the values for initialization or you can look them up in the data sheet. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to unfold and find the uh, main file of my working project. That's, uh, that's not, uh, that's allowed. And these uh, definitions here are basically just uh, yeah register definitions so I'm gonna copy those uh, over to my main um, project here um, you will see here there's a, a value called refresh count and this number is a value of how many milliseconds can elapse before we have to refresh the RAM contents I won't go into much detail but you need to refresh the contents of SDRAM continuously and we can only go 1656 milliseconds before we need to do that and um, that value is specific for my chip uh, it's another value for the discovery board and uh, this value can be calculated I have another video where I go into detail on, on how to fix this or find this so uh, we'll need one more thing if we this is my working program here I just hit F3 to go to the actual function you can see this uh, hsdram1.init uh, this is the same uh, code that that we just created using the cube mx but here in the user code begin fmc on init2 we have some some stuff that is happening that is commands sent to the sdram to configure it for our use case and this code specifically is i have taken this from the 726 application template you can do the same. I just copy this and insert this into my SDRAM uh, or the FMC init after we have uh, done this. So here in the FMC init 2, I just insert this. We need one more thing and uh, that is this uh, command. Uh, that's a command type definition. You can see here now in my other project, I can just hit F3 again and you can see this static FMC SDRAM command type definition called command. I just copy this and insert this in the top of my code here again remember to use uh, to insert code 
between the user code begin and user code end, otherwise it will disappear if you change your IOC file. So I'll just save this and I will close all these other stuff here. Let's just try to build this. Okay, let's try to debug this and let's see what happens. And then let's press resume. And there we have it. We have our display going. We have the frame buffer uh, being updated by the touch GFX. And now the frame buffer is loaded up or out to the display using our Chrome art and LTDC and all that stuff. So this all came down to configuring the SD RAM correctly. Let me just say this one more time. CubeMX does not set up your peripherals for you in a firmware sense of way or in a firmware way. It only makes sure that the hardware connections are all right. And this is a very clear example of that. So right now we have uh, we have the, the the screen running, but we haven't enabled the touch screen. So using this custom way, we have to do everything by ourselves. I will just stop this debugging um, session here. You can see um, in the folder structure in the touch GFX you have. Uh, I just briefly mentioned the GUI uh, here where we have the the different screens and uh, if we go to target here you will have a file called um, the stm32 touchcontroller.cpp and this file is empty to say the least there are a, a few functions and uh, but you need to write something in here um, so so our touch controller can be inserted here and if you look into the application template this is exactly what happens here so no matter what type of display you're using if you're using a resistive touch or a capacitive touch this is where your touch driver and uh, your interaction with touch gfx sh should go so the sample touch method here is sampled um, and if you give it a coordinate uh, then it will return uh, at uh, a touch so to speak, and then touch GFX can handle accordingly to that touch. Um, I won't do that now. I think the video is is too long as as it is. I will uh, make a second follow up video where I'll do two things. The first thing will be how to enable the touch uh, controller. I am uh, so lucky that my uh, custom display here is almost compatible with the touch controller found in the seven four six. The 746 touch controller supports multi-touch, mine does not, so I have modified the driver and just removed that, but other than that I could actually just copy it mostly one-to-one. -one. The second thing I would like to do is show you how to integrate the QSBI flash memory, add that to the linker script so we have the address space and also uh, how to you or how to tell TouchGFX the designer that all the graphical assets should be located in the external memory because that removes the the pressure so to speak from the internal flash again if you have if you have a few few only few screens then you could probably uh, make do with just the internal flash which would be nice so you could actually make a system uh, without the ram without the qspi if your system is just the bare bones um, that of course simplifies the system a lot but also limits your your wiggle room and and your freedom to design um, a full 400 by 480 by 272 um, image is around 255k so you can only store just short of three or four pictures uh, before you you run out of space and I really like this build analyzer we have down here let me just turn off this uh, yeah we'll just uh, move my head up here so you can see the build analyzer says that in our RAM we are using 15% uh, and our flash is currently using just short of 20% and 
and the cool thing is that in memory details here we can actually look into the flash contents and see okay we have a section called external flash section this is a section that will be moved to our quad spi flash later on and if we if we look into that you will have uh, two images image blue buttons round edge small and image blue buttons round edge small pressed so touch effects uses two images one for the button which is uh, the one on the screen right now and then one uh, for the depressed button um, so actually it just switches between those images and that's uh, so it has to store both images it, it can manip manipulate images and also if you want to store a full background image well it was this 255k sort of but the funny thing is that since I used a background uh, uh, just a box a box is just um, a figure um, an outline or something like that well sorry the word escapes me the the box is a, a simple uh, item that it can color programmatically so that means that it c costs almost nothing in terms of memory so only if you want to store uh, an image as a background it's 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 costly so if you you could actually save a lot of memory if you can build up your background using a lot of smaller images and then have the the same color background so they could blend in that could also be an option if you want to save space uh yeah so the video is too long already i want to stop here the last for the last time cube mx is setting up the hardware it does not set up the configuration of your system so if you have a display that requires initialization then you have to do that for example let's just uh, see here if you go to our main file you can see all the uh, the init files here that are generated the gpio in it the dma in it the fmc in it quad spi the crc ltdc oh ltdc that is our uh, uh, LCD controller. So if I hit F3 and go to that, you can see here this is all the hardware setup. But we have space down here for eventual configuration of mo of the display module. So if I wanted to send some special commands to my my display module, I could do it here. I can't remember if this was uh, in the part that cut away with the audio, but if you um, I would I would suggest that you keep your main as short as possible. So main the main file here is auto generated. So what I would do here in the start hardware task, I would call another function that has an infinite while loop, and then I can write that in another file that will make your process or the your your project uh, much more easy to navigate. So have create another file and um, an insert your hardware loop there of course you would need to include uh, some header files but that would make it much easier to to so you don't actually have to look into the main.c file anymore because that should just just be for hardware configuration that that would be my way of doing this uh, of course that's entirely up to you so I hope you like this video. I'm sorry about the the audio issues previously. I hope that uh, this new second part should fix that. Please leave a comment if you have questions or suggestions. And um, yeah, as always, thanks for watching.